Hi guys, Happy New Year and I hope you had a really nice Christmas. Uh, this video is going to be me talking about my favourite books that I read last year. I read 97 books in 2018 and um, I've managed to whittle that number down to 12 to talk about today. Um, I'm really pleased with how many books I read last year, especially since for the latter half of the year I was working full time and also doing a full time um, master's uh, degree. But um, I definitely seem to read most of these books in the first half of the year. Uh, so there's only two here that I have not mentioned in on my channel before. So I'm going to talk about those first and then the other ones I'll mention slightly more briefly. The first one is The Overstory by Richard Powers and this one was nominated for the Man Booker Prize. Um, and I had no idea what it was about really before I read it. And it is slightly hard to explain. It is um, a very wide ranging epic of a novel really um, that's trying to deal with um, ecological issues, um, climate change and uh, human impact on our planet, specifically relating to trees. And it sounds incredibly dry and possibly very dull, but um, it tells the story in a way that is extremely human and it follows the lives of around 10 different individuals. <clears throat> and in the beginning, you see a snapshot of each of their lives and it seems like none of them have much relation to trees. Uh, maybe one or two of them um, sort of have a direct link to trees through their work, you know, in ecological issues. But for the most part, you know, none of them have really considered uh, trees to be a massive part of their life. But uh, you see how each of them is drawn into to this story uh, about how trees are linked together and how they are a massive part of our global ecosystem. And again, I think it's hard to make it seem like it's not incredibly academic or not like a polemic sort of tirade about um, you know global or um, ecological activism. Uh, it's not like that at all and there's there are characters in this book that are um, not you know they're not activists in that way but they they learn um, both sides of the argument and what you know impact humans are having on our environment in a way that is very accessible and it still makes it seem like a really fascinating story even if this isn't something that you would be particularly interested in reading otherwise. The structure of the novel itself reflects its subject matter. It is interweaving and has these subtle but incredibly powerful connections between the characters in the same way as the trees have these linkages and form an entire network around the globe. It is incredibly fascinating and I would really recommend it even if my description of it doesn't make it sound that fascinating. Um, I went into it fairly blind and was like, oh, it's about trees, but it's about, it's about a whole lot more than that. Um, and you can tell when you read it, you feel so comfortable in the knowledge that its author Richard Powers is an incredibly talented author and a fierce intellect as well. Um, I felt very safe um, while reading his book because I, I felt confident that I knew he would do the subject matter well. The next one is something very different again, it's Conversations with Friends by Sally Rooney and this is one that I've been meaning to read for quite a while, although when I first heard about it, it didn't particularly appeal to me, mostly because, well I suppose the cover a little bit, it was like, I don't, I can't get much of an um, inkling about what it's about and the title is incredibly bland, so it didn't seem like the kind of book I would normally gravitate towards, but I've seen so many incredible reviews of it, um, and even though I didn't really know what it was about, I knew it was going to be fairly banal in the subject matter, it's so different to the overstory uh, in the scope of its uh, plot, but I thought I will give it a go. So I got this book for Christmas and I read it pretty much the day after. Um, it's one of those books that you do, you can read in pretty much one sitting. It's fairly short and it is easy to read. I think it's difficult to say whether you'd classify this as a literary novel because I think it has some very interesting complex ideas that you would expect in literary novels but it, um, it shows those in incredibly uh, accessible ways I suppose. The writing itself is quite bare, it's not overly complex or um, you know dense to read at all, you can really fly through it. Um, but I think it's worth spending a little bit of time over sort of thinking about 
um, what things mean on a slightly you know wider level. So it's worth saying a little bit what it's about. Um, it is on the surface a quite mundane plot that follows four characters, uh, two of which are a married couple who are um, minor celebrities and two of which are college students who um, do uh, spoken word poetry together. So there are definitely artsy types and they form an unlikely friendship. The two college students are girls and they used to be in a relationship as well uh, and as the the characters begin to know, get to know each other and form friendships, the sort of clear delineations of the relationships between these characters begin to shift. It's very hard to tell you why this book is so special. It's one of those that just gives you that feeling of just being brilliant, I suppose. Um, it is really a set of conversations between friends and this can make it sound dull or just very prosaic but it, the conversations themselves I think are very intelligently structured and they get to the heart of human behaviour I think in a way that I've seen very rarely in fiction and especially from fiction from someone who is a debut author and is so young. I think it is one of those books that is so firmly set in the late 2010s that it feels incredibly relatable to a modern reader, especially one you know around my age, around the age of the author, because it feels so realistic in terms of how relationships are formed through um, sort of text, through you know text messages or email conversations, and how the medium of text can leave so much room for interpretation and misinterpretation as well. There's that constant over-analysing of what the other person has said and you know real in-depth thinking about what you should respond to be most well received by the other person and it is also so much about how we choose to present ourselves in public or to another person and how this can differ dramatically from what we're like on our own. It's very interesting because the characters are not particularly likeable, I didn't find any of them very likeable, but they feel realistic in a sense, although they're still very unusual, very bizarre characters who make decisions and do things that I don't think many people would do. We can understand their reasoning and we can empathise with them on a level. I find it very interesting as well that when you read books often you have characters, you know, you, you know from the beginning they are courageous, they are, um, you know, uh, self-absorbed, whatever, you have a set of uh, very clear personality markers and you expect them to display those throughout the book. With this book I felt like the characters, obviously they have personalities, they have these markers, people don't always stick to that, you know, we're human beings, we don't always act the way that other people would expect us to, so there are plenty of moments in this where you think, that, that character, that seems a bit out of character, or would they really do that? But I feel like it makes it even more realistic because of the messiness of it, and this contains so many messy relationships and messy conversations that are misunderstood or misinterpreted but I feel like it makes it such a realistic, refreshingly realistic book to read. I don't think I quite realised the artifice in other books until I read this one um, and it was just an absolute joy to read and I'm extremely excited to read Normal People, her second book that's just won Waterstone's book of the year. I think I'm going to try and read that in the next few weeks um, if possible because I've heard it's just as good as this one. Okay, and the rest are going to be books that I have already mentioned, so I will keep it fairly brief for all of them. Um, the first one is The Secret History by Donna Tartt. I made an entire video about this, I think it's called something like the, my best book I have ever read. I think it probably is one of the best books I've ever read. Um, it made such an immediate impact on me and I've thought about it loads since. Um, she is one of, I've only read this book by her so far, although I do really want to read her other two, The Goldfinch and The Little Friend. Um, this again was one of those authors that gave me utter confidence in her ability. She is a genius I think. Um, her writing was so intelligent but didn't show off its intelligence in any way which 
I think is pretty common with literary novels. Um, it, so it's about a murder, really. In some senses, it's a murder mystery. A set of college friends in the US decide to murder one of their group. And you find this out at the very beginning, the very first page. And in some ways, it's a quest to discover why they chose to do this. But it's also just so much more than that. It is. Um, it, it takes a lot from um, Greek ideas that the characters in this book study Greek. And um, it's, I think, it, I don't want to spoil too much, but it talks about pleasure, I suppose, pleasure and beauty. Um, and they seem like very abstract themes, and they kind of are in some ways, and the characters do ponder them in very abstract ways, but they also take actions that, um, that kind of show those ideas in very physical manners. So it is so pleasurable to read because you really fly through it and you want to know what happens, you know, why this has happened, but by the time you do figure it out, which isn't right at the end of the book by the way, you there's so much more that you want to learn. You just want to live inside this world with these bizarre, weird, very unlikable sometimes characters. It's I'll just it's it's fascinating and so well written um, and I can't wait to read more of her work. Next is The Mermaid and Mrs Hancock by Imogen Hermes Gower and I read this right at the start of 2018 and I've mentioned it so many times um, through the year. It is a really, really fascinating historical novel that uh, follows two characters really, a merchant who um, lives in Georgian London and his ship is traded by uh, his shipmaster for a mummified mermaid and he needs to decide what to do with this strange creature uh, to try and earn him back the money he has lost. And it also follows the story of Angelica Neal who is a high-level courtesan um, but has fallen on hard times recently and she gets implicated into this story uh, with the mermaid and um, it really explores gender dynamics in this pe time period. It's also beautifully written with such um, historic accuracy and flair for description but it wears this real depth of research very lightly um, and it's it's not bogged down in these boring details but it it lifts all the the very fascinating aspects of this culture um, to make it really delightful to read. Next is The Tidal Zone by Sarah Moss and this was one of those books that I felt like had quite a big impact on me. Um, it is about a family who uh, have a daughter whose heart stops completely unexpectedly one day and she doesn't die although the doctors aren't sure really what's happened and if it will happen again. So the family are then left in this kind of limbo state, half living and half, you know, mourning I suppose because they don't, they don't know what the future holds for them, for any of them really. And um, in some ways it's about grief and also moving on from this really catastrophic, uh, it, you know, event that's happened in their life but also about tr trying to maintain a sense of normality, especially for their other daughter who takes it quite hard and, and feels quite resentful at times in a way that feels really realistic. Again, it's tricky to really elucidate why this book is so good because um, just a description of the plot doesn't do it justice whatsoever. It's the way Sarah Moss deals with these really sensitive themes and I really love the the dad character in this book who is um, really struggling to to deal with this scenario and you, you see all the the selfish and um, you know maybe immoral thoughts and the struggles that he goes through to try and treat, keep his family together and functioning um, and it feels so heartbreakingly realistic I'll link another video where I talk about this more because I think it's, I'm finding it quite hard to really tell you why I found it so good. It was one of those ones that just left me with that feeling like 
this is a very brilliant book. Um, and another book that I read by Sarah Moss this year was Names for the Sea, um, which is a memoir of her time in Iceland, and I would really recommend that as well. You can tell that she is an incredibly gifted writer, um, and I'd like to read her other books too. The next one is Tin Man by Sarah Winman, and I read this in one sitting and I feel like I definitely need to reread it. I don't have a physical copy of it, so I think I just need to go and buy it. Um, but Conversations with Friends actually reminded me of this book in the sense that it's fairly mundane in what happens and it's about the intricacies of relationships between people, but the people in Tin Man are very different to those in Conversations with Friends, um, and it is just be the, the relationships are, I think, just beautifully rendered. The next one is The Seal Woman's Gift by Sally Magnusson, and this is another historical novel, this time set in Iceland in the 1600s, when uh, quite a significant number of Icelanders were captured by Barbary pirates and taken to Algiers and sold into slavery. It's based on a true story, and it is incredibly heartbreaking as a result of this. It specifically follows one family and how they are torn apart by this horrific event and in some ways it's about them trying to get home and be reunited but it's also about them trying to adapt to this new life that they find themselves in and try and find some joy in this life as well. Um, it is so beautifully written which I've said before but I I feel like I underestimated Sally Magnusson's writing abilities because I know her as a journalist in Scotland, that's what she's known best as, um, but she writes with such such um, like anatomical precision but still such um, beautiful description as well. It, it was a really breathtaking book. Sight by Jesse Greengrass is the shortest of the books that I've chosen as one of my favourites this year and um, in some ways it is the tightest in terms of narrative. Uh, it, is, it is very much uh, an exploration of a singular theme um, over the course of just under 200 pages and that theme is motherhood and um, it, is, it is one of the most impressive books I've ever read. Um, not just uh, you know about motherhood but but overall in terms of the depth of analysis and the intelligence with which this um, topic is is dealt with. I think as well as motherhood this is really about pregnancy as well and it's a state of being that is obviously quite common in, in media you know books and, and other types of media but isn't really given a huge amount of, of thought um, but this really delves into the psychology behind what it means to have another being growing inside you and what it makes you feel like as an individual, not just as a, a mother or a woman, but as a person and, um, and what it means to, to give birth and to then have this other being that is at one, at one time both you and not you. Um, and then I, th I found the most interesting parts of this book were where the character in it has this child and has to to watch it grow up and grow away from her and she feels that kind of grief of separation um, which is mingled with the joy of seeing your child you know become its own person as well. It's a book that I definitely wouldn't recommend for everyone because it is so wrapped up in this singular theme that although there is some sort of plot development and character development where we know there is a character who in some parts of the book is pregnant and in some parts of the book has a child, um, the, what actually happens is really not the point. And in, in some ways it frustrated me because I wanted to know what the logistics of her life were and does she work, what's her job, it's not really described. Um, and I know some people have really complained about that and I totally get those those complaints um, and if you want a book that is that is much more practical then this one is 100% not for you. Um, it is on a different plane of existence entirely, it is so theoretical and in some in some parts you have to really reread what you're writing, what you're reading because it is complex. Uh, there's no real denying that but I think if you spend that time unpicking the ideas it is very worth it. Looking around the books that I've chosen, most of them are pretty accessible and pretty plot-led and this is the exception, I think. Um, it is the, by far the most literary of the books that I've chosen 
um, but it is one that has stuck with me longer than a lot of even the other ones in this list. I read two books by Madeline Miller this year, The Song of Achilles and Circe, and it was kind of hard to choose uh, which of these I wanted to include in this list because I didn't want to really include both. Um, the one I did I feel like I enjoyed most was Circe, and this one just came out in 2018. It is, like Song of Achilles, it is a retelling of a Greek uh, mythological or historical figure. This one is obviously the character of Circe, who you might know from Homer's The Odyssey, and um, she's painted in that text as quite a vengeful witch figure, but this is definitely a type of feminist re re-envisaging of her story and her character, and it's really about her entire life, um, and takes you through a lot of encounters that you will recognise if you've ever read about her before, but it does take a lot of creative licence and um, give you other elements of her life and her character that you probably haven't read about before. I think this book really um, challenges the view that women with some sort of power over men were cast in such a negative light historically uh, and especially in mythology and it gives Circe so many more d um, dimensions to her character while still not casting her as some sort of saint-like, all-good, benevolent figure. She still has a temper, she still makes rash and unjustifiable actions, but you, well, they might be morally unjustifiable, you see how she can justify them. Um, and it does make you think a lot about how women are are depicted in um, much old, much more old ancient texts, as well as kind of giving you this interrogation of feminism. Uh, it's also beautifully written. Of course, it's set on a stunning Greek island, and even the descriptions of the nature and the sea are so beautiful in this book. Um, Madeline Miller is one of those writers whose main profession is as a historian or as an academic and before reading her books I imagined that, that that element of her life would seep a huge amount into her books and of course she takes the research that she's done incredibly seriously and you can see that clearly in her books but it never detracts from the the sort of beauty of the writing itself. Um, similar to Sally Magnuson, I had different expectations of the quality of the actual writing when I read these books, but was absolutely, you know, blown away by how beautifully it was written. The next one is The Gloaming by Kirsty Logan, and uh, this is another one that I read in one sitting, I just devoured it, and uh, it's another one of those mermaid books that has been quite popular in 2018. Uh, although I think it has less of the fantastical elements and more of the real, uh, believable, but also very bizarre elements too. It's about a very odd, quite dysfunctional family who live on an island that um, has magical realist elements that crop up throughout the book and uh, really take the the storytelling up a level, I think. Um, and it is, I suppose, about how other people maybe come to this island and disturb their way of life. When I say this book has mermaid themes, it has a character in it called Pearl who comes to the island whose job it is, is to dress as a mermaid to entertain others. And in a lot of these scenes it blurs the lines between reality and fantasy in an absolutely seamless way. And another thing I really loved about this book is the LGBT themes that it has. Um, and these are done so beautifully and you can tell the, the author um, it knows really what she's talking about. And it for me it takes this book from being an interesting read, a very beautifully crafted read, to something that is so necessary reading I suppose. It um, it has something very worthwhile to say and I really think everyone should read it. My Absolute Darling by Gabriel Talent is the hardest book to read that I read this year. Um, it is incredibly heartbreaking but so well done and um, had such a, a profound impact on me as I read it. Um, I could not not include it even though it is pretty hard to read. Um, it's about a father and daughter who live very remotely and um, 
he is abusive to her mentally, physically and sexually. Because she's been brought up with very little contact with the outside world, she doesn't understand the morality of her father's actions and th those scenes are the most heartbreaking in this book where she does not know what is right and what is wrong. Um, but this book is about her going to sc beginning to start um, at a school and learning what um, how things really should be and learning that her father is not the benevolent loving figure that he paints himself to be. This is a book where characterization I think is at the heart of it and you feel so closely the pain that this girl turtle feels um, but then you also feel the joy that she experiences when she begins to make a friend from her school. I think this is an incredibly brave book to write because it is so violent in so many ways and it could it, it borders that line between being um, acceptable and gratuitous and it never falls into the category of gratuitous. I think every scene, even the hardest to read, has a purpose and um, it is so intelligently written. Um, I never, although it's uncomfortable in so many places to read, it is, it feels important to read and it feels like it's not it's not horrifying for the sake of it, it does have something important to say. And it is definitely not a book that is entirely without hope. I think it's worth saying that it's not something that is going to um, leave you feeling in pieces and like there was no point of reading it at all. I think you do have to be in the right mindset to read it because it is tough, but I would really recommend it. It is so worth reading. The last one on my list is by far the oldest book that is one of my favourites this year and it's Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier and it seems a little bit outrageous to me that I've waited this long in my life to read this book. Uh, it is it is as good as everyone says it is. Um, I don't know if there's anything I can say that hasn't been said already about Rebecca. It is uh, an absolute masterful gothic fiction novel that um, isn't about spooks and scares but is about human relationships and the real horrors that can unfold within them. To summarise very briefly what this book's about, it has an unnamed protagonist who ha is just getting married to someone whose previous wife Rebecca has died and she has to live with this ghost of Rebecca following her wherever she goes and um, I expected this book to be much more visceral in terms of the horror and the ghosts that it contains but these ghosts are much more mental than physical and to me that makes it a much scarier book because this protagonist has to live with these memories and these constant reminders of Rebecca and how beautiful and perfect she was for her husband every, at every given moment of her life. It's also a really fascinating story in itself. I kind of expected that it might um, be a sort of character study uh, that was intelligently done, but I didn't expect it to have so many moments that actually shocked me and made me gasp out loud the way it did. Um, and I often feel like when I read classics, there is such a weight of expectation behind them that they're never gonna actually live up to that. But if you feel like that as well, then I would really try and push that to one side and read this book because it is um, so brilliant in every way, in you know the way it forms these very believable but still outrageous characters, as well as the, the actual plot itself, which is genuinely surprising and shocking at points. It is so worth reading, I can't stress it enough. So those were my favourite books of 2018. I managed to read loads of great books and very few ones that I didn't enjoy, which I'm really pleased about. And for 2019, I want to try and do more of that, but also try and read books that I genuinely want to rather than books that I feel like I'm obliged to read for whatever prize or, or books that I feel like would make good videos. So next week I want to make a video about uh, books that I've been that I've had on my shelf for quite a while that I really want to get around to reading as soon as possible uh, and try and make myself get out of that habit of reading what I think I, I should be reading. Um, 
But anyway, let me know if there are any of these books that you really enjoyed and what your thoughts were, but equally if you have other books that you really enjoyed last year that you would recommend for me. I'm, as usual, looking for recommendations even though I have plenty of books on my bookshelf that I haven't read. Um, but anyway, I do hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next week. Okay, bye bye.